Good evening and welcome. The Kennedy Library has a tradition of hosting tributes for individuals who've graced our stage and whose life work relates in some way to the ideals personified by President Kennedy. Tony Lewis did both. He spoke eloquently at our conference on citizenship and service during sessions on civil rights and the First Amendment in the wake of 9-11, and as part of a number of forums on Robert F. Kennedy, someone he described as not only a remarkable politician, but an extraordinary man. Our other speakers can comment more intelligently on the substance of Tony's work and the principled, caring, and fun-loving manner in which he lived his life. Yet the tender kindnesses he extended to me, someone he would come to know simply through his appearances here, were perhaps noteworthy for the very fact that they were not required and yet so generously extended. His most recent visits to the library were in the role of his wife, Margaret Marshall's greatest fan, at a forum on Robert Kennedy's 1966 trip to South Africa, during which his beloved Margie served as RFK's student host, we screened archival film footage from the trip, and I sat next to Tony during those clips. There's Margie on the right. He'd point out, brimming with pride, look, behind Ethel, there she is again. <laughs> One last personal vignette also involves Margie. Tony spoke at a conference on the presidency and the Supreme Court at the FDR library that I also attended. Hyde Park is not an easy place to get to. And when I overheard Tony explaining that he was planning to spend an extra night, take a car service the next morning to an airport in New York City, and then fly home, I offered to drive him to Cambridge at the conclusion of the two-day conference. He was thrilled by the prospect of getting home sooner, and so on a cold, barren night, we drove together through the winding roads and interminable highways of upstate New York and western Massachusetts. At one point, he called to let Margie know of the change in plans and the conversation ended this way. Okay, he'll say no, I will, I will. He hung up the phone and said, she insists that I offer to drive. <laughs> so I want to publicly thank Margie for so kindly watching out for my interests on that midwinter's night. But more importantly, for allowing us to host what I know will be a warm and memorable evening with dear friends and colleagues. And sincere appreciation to our forum sponsors, to Penn New England, and to each of our speakers, Jill Abramson, James Carroll, Jill Kirk Conway, Rick Hertzberg, Samantha Power, and Master of Ceremonies, Christopher Lydon, for being here to share their special memories of Anthony Lewis, a remarkable writer and teacher and truly extraordinary man. Thank you, Tom Putnam. It is indeed a very tender pleasure and a privilege to be part of this gathering of friends and admirers of Tony Lewis. Um, a most extraordinary journalist, I think the most consequential in many ways liberal journalist of my time and a, an extraordinary public citizen and an absolutely marvelous friend. We, we won't, I'm sure we won't leave out the fun-loving part too. Um, Tony was so generous to me on the 10 o'clock news especially. I mean, I had known him at the Times, but he, he was always at the ready to come and be reasonable, explain things. And then one time to, I forget how this happened exactly, but he said, do you mind if I, we were talking about, it must have been Fred Astaire's birthday or something. Uh, but he said, would you mind if I sang? <laughs> Margie minded, but everybody else uh, totally adored it. Um, I just want to make three sort of summary points uh, before it begins. Uh, I asked a lady in the, coming in tonight, what must we say about Anthony Lewis? And she said that I loved him more than anybody. Uh, for the gents in the group, certainly of my generation, um, there's something else uh, that I just want to say. that All of us shared a certain fantasy um, and there were, there were two versions of the fantasy. One was, oh, to be Anthony Lewis when I grow up. Um, to write that well, to be everywhere, to know everybody, to be such 
an uncommonly civilized journalist who, who read and traveled and, and um, was just an awfully nice person. Uh, the, the variation on the fantasy was if you couldn't be Tony Lewis, the slight, maybe the easier alternative would be to run for president and appoint Tony to the Supreme Court. Uh, that was definitely mine, and I've discovered, uh, I knew a little bit before he died, but after he died, all sorts of guys had, had acknowledged that that was, that was the best reason you could think of to run for president and be president. Uh, we have a wonderfully various uh, group of people to testify about Tony, a man of uh, <laughs> many various qualities and, and, and sides. We begin with Joe Kerr Conway, who was a friend of Tony's for many years. Jill Kirk Conway, author of the famous Road from Kurain about her migration from Australia. But also, I, I, I want to just note that she is a longtime member of the Saturday Club, uh, a, a great institution in this town, of which Tony had been a member for many, many years. This was, the, this was a club founded by Ralph Waldo Emerson in the 1830s and continuously fun and distinguished in Emersonian. This was the, we, we may be hearing about the Emersonian side of Tony, but it's a great pleasure to introduce Jill Kirk Conway. Friends, it's wonderful to have the opportunity to share with you some of the most remarkable aspects of Tony Lewis as I knew him. But I want to begin with something that um, I think he would laugh about if, if I had been smart enough to tell him. Um, I'm Australian by birth. My late husband is Canadian. And we were spending time at Oxford um, at the time that Tony began as head of the Times Bureau in um, London. And it's very interesting. There were two. Uh, elderly dons in um, the, the common room of the uh, uh, college we were affiliated with, who made a point of collecting um, news, ma news material that showed either Australians or Canadians being stupid. <laughs> and um, I was really a little tested by remaining civil to them. But eventually I had my come up, my, their come up, it's because um, they read several reports from uh, Tony's reporting of the European situation at the time. It was a period of trying to rebuild Europe and, and develop a new sense of how to develop the economy. And one day they appeared uh, on, to me on my way to lunch, um, really on fire. And they said, do you know this fellow who runs the Times? Well, I said, he doesn't actually run the Times, but uh, he's very important. Um, and they capitulated completely and said, well, he knows better than we do what should be done. That fellow is smart. <laughs> so I was absolutely delighted and never stopped reminding them uh, of his smartness. I wanted to talk about Tony in, in um, three different respects. I'm a writer, and uh, I know that many in the audience uh, think of him as, as a legal scholar and as a wonderful public citizen. But I have always been tremendously impressed by his capacities as a writer to make very complex issues clear and understandable to a general public. And when I think about the uh, literary skills that are necessary to write a book um, like uh, the uh, wonderful study of um, the problems of being able to lead toward the uh, development of a legal system which did offer um, free counsel for, for uh, people who could not afford to pay for them. 
uh, either at the state or the, or the Supreme Court level. Um, I'm always reminded of the way in which he managed to write about a very, very complex subject, doing full justice to every aspect of the legal issues. But he made the character of the sort of drifter, <laughs> gambler, uh, who was the, the person who actually triggered the, the um, deliberations which produced um, the trial, which finally vindicated the, um, the wastrel and made it um, very clear that in future there would be a commitment to legal aid for prisoners. Um, but if you read uh, that wonderful book, uh, th that really summarizes the whole struggle, you will find that in the middle of every section, there is a wonderful outpouring of, um, I, I would say, really a literary speech, which makes the, the um, subject um, totally comprehensible as a, uh, really, really de degenerate um, character, but one whose sense of his rights to his um, legal position uh, was strong enough to, to uh, overcome. But the, the character of this individual is de delineated in so many wonderful ways, right in the middle of some very complex discussion of legal issues. And I believe that um, Tony managed better than almost anyone I know to write about a political subject or a legal subject in a way that blended the skills of a literary scholar with those of a legal scholar. And we are all the beneficiaries of that. The th third thing I'd like to uh, bring up this evening, because we are many and mustn't take too long, <laughs> is the extent to which he managed um, to interest people in important subjects, mainly by the capacity he had to, to simplify. And he was also able to reach many people by uh, moving from legal issues to issues of character. And those issues of character in all his writing are really literary gems. So I celebrate him as a writer and a creator of wonderful characters um, with just as much um, energy and ad admiration as I do his legal writing. I think finally, uh, one can only marvel at the ability of a man who was really suffering and ill for a very long time to maintain his daily schedule with, of course, the wonderful uh, management and advice and help of Maggie, but who managed right up to the last days of his life to be working as a public servant and in the interest of serving uh, the legal profession. So my hat is off to a man who had many, many talents, which would have been very striking in somebody who was a humanistic scholar and who uh, managed to educate us all about uh, civil rights, even for um, somebody who was a uh, drifter or a, a failure or um, an unattractive person. And that is something that I will always revere because he knew how to do that and to get people to understand the problems of um, many different kinds of otherwise unattractive people. So. Um, 
I, I close by saying that um, this man has left a permanent mark on our country and our legal system, and his work to bring that about uh, will long inspire uh, others to follow. Thank you. <clears throat> Hendrik Hertzberg really needs no introduction. He is the marvelous editorialist and writer in the talk section of The New Yorker, before that in The New Republic, um, and other marvelous institutions. Um, but come to glory in The New Yorker. Uh, I think of Rick as a kind of one of many, but a particularly um, stellar sort of um, adapter of the Tony Lewis model. I mean, it, this is a funny imitated business. Tony and the, the, the famous Times Bureau that he grew up in uh, was sort of built on the James Reston model. Uh, I wore bow ties actually before I met James Reston, but you know it, it was it was just fun to be part of that club. I think uh, Rick is a marvelous extension, marvelous extension of sort of the Tony Lewis example, the Tony Lewis club, shall we speak? Rick Hertzberg. Uh, thank you, Chris, and thank you for so many decades of wonderful television, radio, and podcasting. I love the sound of your voice. <laughs> so do I. Uh, um, well, it, it, it was really a humbling surprise for me to have been asked to say a few words in celebration of, of Anthony Lewis. Uh, unlike uh, the others on this platform, and unlike a lot of you in this audience, I, I didn't know him well in a conventional sense. Uh, he and I never spent more than a few hours in the same room at the same time but I knew his kindness. I was, many young, I was one of many young journalists and not so young journalists whom he thrilled with little notes and, and later emails of encouragement and praise and, and sometimes most thrillingly with a telephone call. And of course, like a million others, like all of you, I knew him through his work, through the hundreds of hours I spent with him as a reader through the clarity and decency and moral force of what he wrote. And of course, I knew him as a model of what a journalist could and should be. Well, in the late 1970s, when I was a speechwriter in Jimmy Carter's uh, White House, I, please note, was in the habit of suggesting to whoever would listen that it would be a splendid idea to appoint for President Carter to nominate <laughs> Anthony Lewis to the Supreme Court. Now, Tony was not a lawyer, but, but that, was, that was the point. The Constitution requires no such thing, and, and neither, does the, neither does the right and the ability to interpret the Constitution. Well, in the 19th century, very few lawyers had, had formal legal schooling, including justices of the Supreme Court. And in the 20th century, at least two members of the court, both appointed by FDR, uh, did not have law degrees. And you know, part of Jimmy Carter's appeal was a certain skepticism about lawyers. Uh, one of his earliest and best speeches as president was an eloquent critique of the legal system and the legal profession delivered before a stone-faced crowd at the Los Angeles County Bar Association. <laughs> by the way, that speech was written by, uh, not by me, but by another of Tony's admirers, James Fallows. Well, unfortunately, President Carter didn't get to make a single Supreme Court appointment. And if there had been an opening, I have my doubts that he would have followed advice from the likes of me. But I still think it was a splendid idea. I will always think of Tony as the 10th justice, and on alternate days, uh, as the fourth author of the Federalist Papers. <laughs> he knew more about the Constitution and the laws, more about their history and their meaning, and love them more than the vast majority of Supreme Court justices, let alone lawyers. In 1956, James Reston sent him back to Cambridge for a year study at Harvard Law School on a Neiman Fellowship, and he learned well. Felix Frankfurter told Reston that there are no two justices of this court who have such a grasp for these cases. And Anthony Lewis, unlike all but a few justices, or even their clerks, 
could write. He was sometimes cited in the court's opinions, but my God, think of the ones he could have written himself. <laughs> Above all, think of the dissents. Last week I was exchanging emails about Tony with a dear friend of mine who was also a dear friend of Tony's and who's here tonight. Uh, that's Bernard Avishai. He and Tony were in the same monthly lunch group for many years. Was that the one you mentioned? It was a different one. It's one of them. <laughs> they toured the west bank of the Jordan River together and they worried about Israel's fate together, among other things. But here's something Bernie Avishai pointed out to me about Tony's fascination with constitutional law and legal exegesis. I often thought of Tony as a kind of secular Jew in the high sense like Brandeis, an original responsible mind, a man whose Torah was the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, and whose inspiration was prophetic. That is, a man who denounced injustices, especially when the letter of the law got in the way of its democratic spirit. No law was sacred, but the right to interpret law most certainly was. The law as a whole is what defines us. No bad apples, just bad barrels. In another time and place, a, perny, a person with Tony's sensibilities, his love of law, his disgust of, with tyranny, would have been a Talmudist defying the Inquisition. Now before I sit down, I just want to say a word about someone else who's here tonight. Margaret Marshall is a heroine as surely as her husband was a hero. Now, I, I can boast that I admired her from afar long before she met and married Tony. In 1965 and 66, the year after I finished college, I worked for the US National Student Association, and there was just one student leader overseas whose name we all knew. She was the courageous president of NUSAS, the National Union of South African Students, a multiracial organization steadfastly opposed to the apartheid system. It is astonishing, but maybe not so surprising, that Margaret Marshall grew up to be the Chief Justice of the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court and the author of the majority opinion that found the denial of marriage equality to be incompatible with the constitution of this commonwealth. Now, I have no idea whether she and her husband discussed that particular case at home. <laughs> But I'm pretty sure that the general views of her spouse were, were consonant uh, with her own. And that his example was not without inspirational qualities. Now, as we all know from what has followed over the last decade, that decision has had as profound and positive an effect on American life and liberty as all but a tiny handful of decisions of the United States Supreme Court itself. So. <laughs> So, so it's almost as if Tony were the 10th justice after all, <laughs> or maybe the 11th. Thank you. As Jill Kirkconway mentioned or discovered, uh, Tony Lewis did not run the New York Times, but our next speaker, Jill Abramson, does run the Times. She's, <laughs> She is the executive editor of that great paper, um, succeeding, among others, Abe Rosenthal, who was known as the sun god uh, in my time at the, at the paper. Uh, but it's a huge job and a huge woman to fill it, Jill Abramson. Thank you, Chris. You do have a gorgeous voice, but I have to say, there is one voice more gorgeous than yours, and that was Tony Lewis's voice. He had the best voice, and as one who definitely doesn't, uh, you know, I just, the first time I heard him on the telephone, I just remember thinking like, oh, please keep talking, Mr. <laughs> Lewis. I could listen to you forever. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm very, very proud to be here, mainly 
to speak a little bit about Tony's career at the New York Times, but I'm so honored to be really the representative from the Times family to come here to speak a little bit about Tony tonight. Uh, Margie, right as we were coming onto this stage, uh, said something that is absolutely right uh, about Tony, and that is that he was such an optimist, and that one of the things that gave him so much optimism is that he was always surrounded by young people and always taking inspiration from the interesting young people he would meet. And I first encountered Tony when I was a nervous undergraduate at Harvard and he had come to lunch at the Signet Society, which I had recently been elected to. A lot of student journalists uh, were invited to join it. But, you know, meeting Anthony Lewis, to me, a girl who grew up on the west side of Manhattan, raised by parents who had no religion other than the editorial pages <laughs> of the New York Times, was definitely akin to meeting God. And, you know, but there he was, just modest and... Uh, interested in all of the students that were sitting around him at, at the table. He was just a total natural. And uh, I restrained myself at that point from telling him, you know, I don't know what my, my parents worship you and I worship you. I, I didn't say that. But I know looking out at all of you who are here tonight, you know, how much he meant to all of you to hopefully um, as readers of the New York Times. Uh, you know, Tony meant so much to American letters. His news stories, his columns, and his book are really just an archive of clear-headed thinking, moral certainty, courage, and most of all, fantastic shoe leather reporting. He was a New York Times legend and one of the biggest voices among a group in Washington who were known as Scotty's Boys, the great journalists who James Reston, the bureau chief, gathered around him who included Tony, Tom Wicker, Max Frankel, and other, others who flocked to John F. Kennedy's Washington and energized my profession. Tony was also the supreme gentleman I had to lead a panel discussion at the Times uh, to commemorate the newspaper's unparalleled coverage of the four days of President Kennedy's assassination to his funeral, the Friday through the Monday. And for the 40th anniversary, the Times published a book, and it was literally all of the articles. It was thousands upon thousands of pages of amazing words that all of the people who um, were in Scotty Reston's bureau had written beginning in Dallas uh, through the funeral in Washington on Monday. And uh, I was incredibly excited. I was the moderator of the panel, uh, which included Tony, but also Tom Wicker, who I, I had never met, and uh, a few others. And I began, uh, you know, Wicker had been the, the correspondent on the scene in Dallas who actually wrote the main lead story in the newspaper. And I thought, you know, Tom Wicker, I get to ask him about that day and to try to get him to share anecdotes with the audience gathered in the Times Center. And Mr. Wicker clearly was not in a mood to like recount colorful stories. It was just, it was, he's a, a wonderful journalist, but it was like pulling teeth. And from the very beginning of this panel, I just had that feeling that a moderator sometimes gets, I was in big trouble. But when I said Tony was consummate gentleman. Tony just gently sort of 
interceded as I, about the fifth time I was desperately trying to pull some memories from Mr. Wicker, you were in Dallas. What was it like? You must have been so nervous on deadline and he was just deadpan. So Tony just very gently kind of interjected and joined the discussion and basically took over from my, uh, my fumbling. And, uh, you know, he, uh, he just, he was the best raconteur I've ever heard uh, about important moments in history and journalism. And he was wonderful that night. The crowd ate up everything he had to say. And I wanted to just run over and kiss him on stage. I did. Uh, you know, at dinner um, after the events, Tony corrected me on one thing. Although they'd been called Scotty's boys, Tony thought one of the best reporters in their group was actually a girl, Marjorie Hunter. I'd never heard of her, uh, and she, Tony told me she was the only woman in the Washington Bureau at that time. And he simply said to me at the end of the dinner, you should go back and read her. And I did, and she wrote with just pointless beauty, but so did Tony. And since we're here at the Kennedy Library tonight, and we'll soon be uh, thinking about the 50th anniversary of, of the president's death, I wanted just to talk a little bit about Tony's journalism that same long weekend, the Friday through the Monday, because he wrote some of the most uh, memorable articles, uh, and I reread them uh, last week and, and just want to read a, a, share a few lines of what he wrote. He described Mrs. Kennedy fa Mrs. Kennedy's face as looking, quote, like that of a 34-year-old girl burdened with sorrow instead of a president's wife. He caught the hinge moment of history with directness and authority. Detachment, understatement, irony, sophistication, coolness. These were the qualities that were seen in the manner of John F. Kennedy. The trademarks of Lyndon Johnson are emotion, flamboyance, folksiness. This is really journalism at its best. Gideon's Trumpet lives as the single best book ever written about a Supreme Court case. Tony's chronicle about Clarence Earl Gideon was optimistic about a future where effective legal assistance would be available to all criminal defendants. Sadly, that promise remains unfulfilled. I wrote about a different Clarence, Justice Thomas. I I first made Tony's professional acquaintance when I was still working at the Wall Street Journal, and Tony called to tell me how much he admired Jane Mayer and my investigative reporting on the Thomas, on the Thomas and Anita Hill controversy. He also liked the title of our book, Strange Justice. Tony knew a thing or two about that. Later, after I joined the Times, he sent supportive emails every time I wrote an investigative piece about Ken Starr during the Clinton impeachment. It was hard to report against Washington's grain at that point, and at the beginning of the Lewinsky scandal, that's what I was doing. And Tony knew a thing, about, a thing or two about that, too. The last time I saw him, he donned a tuxedo to a attend a Harvard roast for me. He wasn't feeling all that well, but he was as always game and as dapper as could be. He actually, when I met him that night, he looked like Fred Astaire. <laughs> he was journalism's Fred Astaire. <laughs> Not only is that true, Joe, but I think it's, a, we could talk all night and nothing would please Tony more than the, the, the Fred Astaire connection. Um, Jim Carroll 
is well known in these parts as a novelist uh, of huge range and a columnist in the Boston Globe, but I would say he's very much somehow in that Anthony Lewis tradition, also in the Anthony Lewis Saturday Club, Jim Carroll. William Roper. So now you give the devil benefit of law. Sir Thomas More. Yes, what would you do? Cut a great road through the law to go after the devil? William Roper. Yes, I'd cut down every law in England to do that. Sir Thomas More. Oh, and when the last law was down and the devil turned round on you, where would you hide, Roper? The law is all being flat. This country is planted thick with laws from coast to coast, man's laws, not God's. And if you cut them down and you're just the man to do it, do you really think you could stand upright in the winds that would blow then? Yes, I'd give the devil benefit of law for my own safety's sake. These lines are, of course, from Robert Bolt's A Man for All Seasons, which debuted in London in 1966, when Tony was there as Times Bureau Chief. Tony loved that passage, citing it to great effect, for example, in a 1987 column about Iran-Contra. The view expressed here by Thomas Moore, Tony wrote, animated the framers of our Constitution. Tony Lewis, a secular man, upheld the sacredness of law more powerfully than any one of his generation, as we've heard so eloquently this evening. Against the standard of law across half a century, Tony measured the plight of the poor, the rights of the disenfranchised, the immorality of America's worst war, the intrusions of government, the paradoxes of humanitarian intervention, the unfairness of free market economies, the dangers of the war on terror, and the permanent urgency of responsible citizenship. Even the claims of journalism, Tony measured against the standard of law, drawing sidelong glances, to put it mildly, from fellow journalists. He upheld law not as an abstraction or untethered ideal, but as a pragmatic tradition rooted in the United States Constitution, protected by courts, honed by trained advocates, and kept alive by common people. What moves me most as one profoundly unqualified to comment on law, is that Tony did all of this not as a lawyer, but as Jill Kerr Conway so movingly reminded us, as a writer. One can almost hear him say, a mere writer. Tony taught legions of us writers, including those present here, that if the law is sacred, so is writing. The simple act of giving expression to what you think because you think it. It was as a writer that Tony took me as a friend, but that happened years after, as a reader unknown to him, I had presumed to regard Anthony Lewis as a friend. 
on the page, he gave me permission when I was still young enough to need it to think what I thought eventually having learned well from him. I could think what I thought and write it even when he disagreed and what friends we became then. It is impossible for me, and Margie above all knows this very well, to give adequate expression now not to what I think, but to how I feel about Tony and his absence. Like law and like writing, friendship is sacred too. Tony taught me that, but not even the word friend says enough. What then? Perhaps Tony would allow me to try once more through Robert Bolt. Sir Thomas More in the Tower. If we lived in a state where virtue was profitable, common sense would make us saintly. But since we see that abhorrence, anger, pride, and stupidity commonly profit far beyond charity, modesty, justice, and thought, perhaps we must stand fast a little, even at the risk of being heroes. Margaret Moore. But in reason, haven't you done as much as God can reasonably want? Sir Thomas More. Well, finally, it isn't a matter of reason. Finally, it is a matter of love. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim Carroll. Um, Samantha Power is, as all of the speakers here tonight, quite special. She, I mean, she reminds me, among other things, that Tony taught, he did teach writing, but it was in such a complex, all of which uh, shaped Samantha Power's interests and her career in law. She met him and fell under her spell, she was saying to me tonight, when she was at the Harvard Law School, but she was also, her range is something like Tony. She's been vitally interested in, in rights, in human rights, in war, and in peace, starting when I first met Samantha when she was shuttling back and forth between law school and the former Yugoslavia in the 90s, but also in justice and in politics. Uh, it's a special pleasure to introduce the United States Ambassador to the United Nations, Samantha Power. Uh, it is such a huge honor uh, to be here and to be part of this uh, incredible event. I don't get out much anymore. <laughs> And, uh, and I certainly don't get to hang with some of the right, finest writers of, you know, of our times. Uh, so I was scribbling furiously various uh, turns of phrase and uh, quotations and so forth. Um, but Margie, I just want to thank you personally for including me in this uh, extraordinary tribute uh, for an extraordinary man. Uh, there's nowhere I would rather be uh, this evening, and that includes Bush Stadium. Uh, which. <laughs> I think it's true of many here as well. We could stay here all night uh, without checking, you know, box scores and so forth. Um, whatever the issue, uh, whether it was right to legal counsel, free speech, racial justice, 
apartheid, genocide, war, peace. Tony laid out the facts and wrote, as has been said, what he believed, systematically, eloquently, ferociously. And that's why he inspired uh, so many of us here tonight. I grew up reading at home abroad and abroad at home and whatever else he called his columns. What mattered only was the byline, Anthony Lewis, a synonym for adult conversation and a morally literate view of the world. In Bosnia, where I was a rookie reporter, deeply unsettled by the atrocities going on around me, he brought that singular passion of his to call on the United States to intervene to protect civilians. He was against bystanding. In a way, over his whole career, whatever he covered, he was kind of the unbystander or the upstander, perhaps. In law school, after I got back from the war in Bosnia, the law seemed abstract to me and very removed from real lives. Then I encountered the genius of Gideon's trumpet. And don't forget, make no law. As a writer studying law, I knew exactly what I wanted to be. Anthony Lewis with freckles. <laughs> totally unrealistic ambition. I had no chance. But one of the great thrills of my life came when I was a 1L in law school and Kitty Galbraith, knowing I'd been a journalist in Bosnia, invited me over for dinner to meet Tony Lewis. The Anthony Lewis. He shared his view of the Bosnian war, but he also asked about the war. A journalist to his core, he could never miss the possibility for an interview, even with a 25-year-old 1L. But he also tried to engage me on the parallels as he saw them, or the possible parallels, I'm conscious with Jim Carroll here, uh, with FDR's response to the Holocaust. The blank look on my face uh, betrayed my ignorance of the particulars. He did not hide his disgust. <laughs> Samantha, he said at the end of this long, sort of beautiful, wonderful, my own perfect dinner in my own mind, as the dinner wound down, Samantha, you're a bright person. And you may have a good career ahead of you, but you simply don't know history. I was completely crushed. <laughs> Laid bare by Tony Lewis, the Anthony Lewis. He did not suffer fools, which made the reward extra sweet when he decided you weren't one. A year after meeting him, I wrote a paper for a law school class on the history of US responses to the major genocides of the 20th century. And I shared the paper with Tony. To this day, like Jill, I remember where I was standing when he called. I was in my group house in Cambridge with seven other people with their stuff all over the place and I was on a telephone that was attached to a very large fax machine. <laughs> and he told me I should think about turning this uh, little history paper uh, into an article or a short book. It was the ultimate ratification. If Tony Lewis believed, I could believe. And in large part, thanks to his encouragement, the paper became a long book on genocide. Both willfully and reflexively, many of us tried to model themselves on Tony. And he taught me a lot more than history over the years and with the notes and the, and the lunches. He taught through how he worked. No one worked harder at his profession than him. No one was more fearless, as has been said, in challenging the official version of truth. No one seemed so unashamed in using the power of the pen, pen to try to tip the scales of justice in the right direction. And for all of his empathy and his indignation, he never forgot that he would win more people over by showing than telling. As he transformed abstract legal principles into compelling human stories that made us rethink our ideas about fairness and law, he showed and he told. But more than any of this, and this is the really important part, uh, he offered uh, a clearer lesson. Once he found the woman of his dreams, that lesson was that love mattered more than anything. And there he practiced a little showing and a little telling, as most of you know. Indeed, I think when one looks back, maybe his lifelong fight for justice can re retrospectively be viewed as his effort to level the playing field so that others too could live free and equal enough to have the time and the wherewithal to fall in love. 
In recent years, he worried that in this new era of blogs and tweets, we might find ourselves swamped with opinions, but a little short on facts. He was concerned that although shouters and haters had come to overpopulate the airwaves, the inheritors of his own proud tradition were becoming increasingly hard to find. And it is worth asking, who will pick up the baton from Anthony Lewis? Who will push us to rise above our prejudices and think critically about the world and about our ability as individuals to make a small difference within it? I don't know the answers to these questions, but when talking to aspiring young writers, I urge them to audition for the role of being the next Tony Lewis. They may or may not end up with a column in the New York Times, Jill will decide that, but they will undoubtedly process the injustice and indignities around them in a wholly different way. Anthony Lewis is no longer among us, but he'll always be with us. His words, his example, his warmth, his love of justice, his love of being in love, and the memory of his embrace, both intellectual and literal, live on. Thank you so much. And now, finally, it's just a completely undeserved privilege to introduce the girl of Tony's dreams, Margie Marshall. It is such a delight to be here, but I want to start um, before um, I make three quick points with two things. First, would you please join me in giving just a huge standing, stamping applause for the fabulous six people who have been here. And my second um, preliminary horse to oeuvre, hors d'oeuvre. Um, I was important to Tony's life, but I wasn't more important than his three children. And there is something romantic about the story of Tony and me, and I understand that. But they had to live with Tony for 85 years and 363 days, and that took some doing. So please, Eliza, please stand, David and Mia. So now my three points. Tony would be so honored to be celebrated in this of all places, in this of all places, because I think the two politicians for whom he really did have the greatest respect were President John F. Kennedy and Senator Robert F. Kennedy. It has been noted that Tony might have strayed a little overboard, particularly when Robert F. Kennedy blew into London before he came to South Africa, where I met him. He was really taken with this young senator, and there were many times in the decades after that Tony would say to me, now if only Robert Kennedy had been the president, which is not to detract from what he felt from the death of President John F. Kennedy. Uh, but I want to thank Amy and Tom and Tom and Penn and the library for hosting this event. Tony would have loved it. Second, uh, when Amy called and said, who would you like to suggest to pay tributes to Tony? That was a very, very difficult decision because there were lots of people that Tony respected. But the thing that Tony loved about people more than anything else was moral courage and great integrity. And it didn't take me very long going through my long list of people to come up with six amazing human beings who had just great moral courage and great integrity. And so I thank you for each of you for what you brought to Tony's life. Sometimes I would pick up the phone, but more often than not, I would walk in when Tony was talking on the phone. And I could always talk, tell when he was talking to one of these six because there was a kind of relaxed, 
joy, love of what they were doing. And of course, Tony loved everybody of every age. And so thank you for coming and for traveling. And as you can, he didn't like New York, but we managed to get a good contingent from New York, this man who was brought up in New York. And third, I thought I would perhaps mention a couple of anecdotes. It was such fun to live with Tony Lewis. You have no idea how much fun. It was a pain in the neck too, but it was a lot of fun. And I want to tell you when I, what I loved most about him, and we've heard almost every speaker talk about Tony's sort of moral core. What I loved deeply about Tony is he never lost the capacity to be truly angry when he heard about something which outraged him. He had the kind of anger that I remember having as a student in South Africa, but he just kept it going and kept it going and kept it going decade after decade. And one of my first encounters with this was that he and I were having lunch in Lincoln Center, a little restaurant near Lincoln Center in New York City. And I was, this is long before we were married, and I was recounting to him an anecdote, it wasn't an anecdote, it was a story really of an African friend of mine who in Boston had watched two white policemen, my friend thought, confronting a young black man rather aggressively. And so my African friend walked over to the policeman to ask them why they were somewhat mishandling this young man. The outcome, outcome was not terribly surprising, as I told Tony, is the police turned on towards my friend, grabbed him and started beating him and pulled his jaw apart so it actually broke his jaw. And Tony, forgive me all, you will all jump. We were sitting at this little table <laughs> at this restaurant, and he said, I can't stand that. And these New Yorkers had this wonderful New York, they just moved over. <laughs> and what I learned from that was Tony was going to be Tony, even if he was sitting in the middle of the restaurant in the middle of the day. He had great integrity. He had integrity that drove me crazy. For example, when we traveled together, when he was working for the New York Times and he was on our business trip, and we went from China to Jerash and Petra to Cambodia to Poland, even to Hawaii, Tony would engage in this discussion with the fresh front desk about they had to separate the women's laundry from the men's laundry because he couldn't charge the New York Times for washing my... <laughs> underwear, and so he needed two different laundry bags. I mean, I'm not kidding. And I used to say to him, you know, Tony, who cares? And, but right down to the very last, you know, my laundry was washed separately from his laundry, and we kept a separate tab as we, as we went along. Um, Rick, he had such integrity. We never discussed opinions. We never discussed opinions. He had no idea how the Supreme Judicial Court was going to rule in the Goodridge case. No idea. And the morning that the opinion was coming out, he didn't even know when the opinion was coming out, but I was leaving at about 8.30 or 9, and the court had um, a practice of announcing at 8 o'clock in the morning when the opinions would come out. And as I was leaving, and I knew Tony wasn't going to read the internet from the Supreme Judicial Court, I said to him, you know, the opinion will come out this morning, and he said to me, how is the court going to rule? And I had a moment of great worry, and I said, do you promise you won't phone anybody? <laughs> and he said, no, I'm not going to phone anybody, and I told him, and he said, well, that's a really interesting thing for the court to do. <laughs> and then I had to leave. <laughs> and there was just not a... And then when, by the time I got home, I had to go to a conference. He had read the entire opinion, and then he told me his view of the entire opinion. But it was one of those, you know, really difficult moments. Uh, Tony loved young people. He loved his grandchildren, two of the six... Uh, we had six granddaughters, one grandson, two of them are here, Beatrice and Zoe, and they are... Lily, you're also here. You're supposed to be working. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So I have three granddaughters who are here. Tony loved them, he adored them, and they are brilliant and they are beautiful, and nothing pleased him more than to spend time on Martha's Vineyard when he was relaxed, I was relaxed, and to spend time with his grandchildren. They did bring one wonderful thing into his life. Tony never had a computer. To the day he died, he used to write like this, clank, 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 clank. I mean, he didn't know about word processing. He didn't have a select click. He just wrote on his old manual typewriter. That's the way he wrote. And so when the grandchildren started sending me emails, I would they'd send them to me, I would print them out, give them to Tony, and then Tony started dictating responses. And I said, I'm not going to dictate responses. You have to learn to do email. And he did. And what he loved most about it, Jill, and the others here, is all of a sudden he could write to every Times journalist and some others, <laughs> and some others around the world knowing knowing that his communications to them, and they were usually little billet doux or some criticism or correcting a spelling or something, and he knew they would get them. When Tony died and I, was, and I was clearing out his desk, I found stacks and stacks and stacks of stamps to make sure that those letters could have been sent to Jordan or China, where any times the reporter was writing this. He just loved, he absolutely, um, loved to do that. Tony, oh gosh, Tony, we had such a wonderful love affair. We just thrived on each other. Um, I won sometimes, he won sometimes. My best win was when um, <laughs> the... <laughs> was when there was a petition for cert filed in the United States Supreme Court uh, to consider the Bush against Gore case. They'll never take the case, said Tony. Oh, they will, I said. No, he said, the Constitution doesn't give them any jurisdiction. I said, they will pay no attention. <laughs> <laughs> they took the case, and I had a real good meal out of that one. But we just, we had a coming and going that was just wonderful. I have received hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of letters and emails, and what comes through again and again and again is Tony's humility, his ability to talk to people um, who weren't famous, who weren't people that he knew very well. Uh, I was telling these wonderful speakers earlier that when Tony and I would have a dinner party and it had a couple of famous people, they often had spouses who hadn't had professional careers, and I always put that woman next to Tony mm. because it was so easy for him to find something to talk about, and perhaps it was that he never missed an opportunity to be a journalist. But he always would say, you know, I talked to X and it would be, you know, a wonderful person who wasn't uh, particularly well known, and he always learned something about it. So thank you for sharing your memories with me. Um, there's a great big hole in my life and in my heart, but I really do know that he lives on for a very long time. Thank you. Thank you, Margie. Thank you, everybody. Could I just ask all of us in, in the audience to sort of hold your seats till we clear the stage, and um, off we go. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.